Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in our Talks with Walt as we are calling our readings through the deathbed edition of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. We turn now to a little poem, You Felons on Trial in Court. Uh, this is poem number 16 of the 38 of Autumn Rivulets. Uh, we will uh, remind ourselves that in earlier studies we've talked about Autumn as being the old and Rivulets as being the new. This poem was actually once called by uh, Whitman Sprig of Confession. Sprig, of course, playing into that whole thing of lilacs and obviously leaves of grass. I'm fascinated by this poem, especially its placement following to him that was crucified, the poem that we just worked with. Now, the assumption, again, is that you've been following our stuff at LearnStrong.net, down that left-hand side, Talks with Walt, and that you've been with us from that very first invitation word come, all the way up to and including a set of comments four autumn rivulets, and then we just finished to him that was crucified. In other words, he says in that poem that he is part of that project of Christ, that is to say that inclusivist project of Christ. Here, we will play in more into that game. You'll remember, of course, from your reading of the Gospels, Luke uh, 5, 27 through 30, that Christ was maligned for eating with publicans and sinners is the way it's often translated out of the Greek. It's a fascinating phrase. We're going to see Whitman playing a similar game here. Now, our Nortons that gives us some background information will tell us that this poem was first published as Leaves of Grass number 13 in Leaves of Grass 1860, beginning with eight lines removed from all succeeding editions. Uh, those lines run like this. Uh, oh, bitter sprig, confession sprig, in the bouquet I give you place also I bind you in, proceeding no further till humbled publicly I give fair warning once for all. I own that I have been sly, thievish, mean, a prevaricator, greedy, derelict, and I own that I remain so yet. What foul thought but I think it, or have in me the stuff out of which it is thought. What in darkness, in bed at night, alone, or with a companion. End quote. There are no other significant changes, now back to Norton's, there are no other significant changes after 1860, although the confession note was also struck by a revision of title which Whitman made in his 1860 blue copy, but never honored, Sprig of Confession, as we said. Now, I find this poem truly remarkable, and, let's say it out loud, certainly when it was published, this was one more of those radical poems that will sit in the heart of Leaves of Grass, often overlooked. Let's play with it. You felons on trial in courts. You felons on trial in courts, you convicts in prison cells, you sentenced assassins, chained and handcuffed with iron. Who am I, too, that I am not on trial or in prison? Me, ruthless and devilish as any, that my wrists are not chained with iron or my ankles with iron. You prostitutes flaunting over the trottoirs are obscene in your rooms. Who am I that I should call you more obscene than myself? Oh, culpable, I acknowledge, I expose. Oh, admirers, praise not me, compliment not me. You make me wince. I see what you do not. I know what you do not. Inside these breastbones, I lie, smudged and choked, beneath this face that appears so impassive. Hell's tides continually run. Lust and wickedness are acceptable to me. I walk with delinquents with passion and love. I feel I am of them. I belong to those convicts and prostitutes myself, and henceforth I will not deny them, for how can I deny myself? Now, there is no question, this is a compelling set of lines. To identify with the worst of society of Whitman's day is immediately going to make him an iconoclast, no question about it. But notice how brilliantly he plays the game of that identification, having again this conversation with the skeptical reader who is probably going to look at him and say, really? You associate with that? And immediately we are obviously in the tradition, not only of Christ, but of all of those who have ever tried to identify with the downhearted, with the broken, the Gandhis, the Mother Teresas, the Martin Luther King Juniors of, of course, history. Notice he begins by talking to felons on trial in court, and he uses the word you three times. You convicts in prison cells, you sentenced assassins chained and handcuffed with iron. Uh, now, obviously, in Whitman's day, this kind of reference is a little bit more real because he's talking with people who themselves will have seen any number of criminals and the like arrested and taken away. 
and the like. And so there's a very, it's very palpable as he's speaking to these felons, to these convicts, and then interestingly the selection of the word assassins. And then he asks it. In the only time this formulation gets used in all of these agras, who am I to that I am not on trial or in prison? Now this identification with the other, we have seen this so regularly. I mean, go back to Song of the Open Road for just one of those many, many examples we can think of. Notice, and then he'll represent himself as ruthless, devilish as any. I think this is powerful, and it, and it kind of taps into what the great Jordan Peterson has argued in some of his early writings with Maps of Meaning and elsewhere, that it is only when one can realize or accept, as he has accommodated, Portis Peterson has commented in his study of Schultz and Nietzsche, that one, you, could, you have to accept the fact that the worst of the worst could be you, could be me. Given the right circumstances, given the right opportunities, all humans have this ability to be ruthless, to be devilish. Notice, me ruthless and devilish as any, that my wrists are not chained with iron or my ankles with iron. Notice the power of the rhetorical question here. You, and now we'll say it, prostitutes, we'll see this two poems later to, um, to, in his poem, to a common prostitute. He's almost like setting us up for that one. And we've heard about the prostitute with the pimply neck and all of that. You prostitutes flaunting over the tartars, he uses the French word for sidewalks, or obscene in your rooms. And by the way, the word obscene only gets used one time in Leaves of Grass and it's here. I find this fascinating that Whitman's Leaves of Grass was labeled obscene a number of times, right, in the censorship boards and the like. And then he asked the second time, who am I that I should call you more obscene than myself. Well, this is obviously going to take us back to the John 8 passage of the Gospel of John when a prostitute is brought in front of Christ and he'll you know, bend down and write something in the dirt and then let him who is without sin cast the first stone. Clearly, Whitman is channeling that kind of a story here. Notice, he'll say it of himself, Oh, culpable, as in guilty. I acknowledge, and then again the French word, I expose. Oh, and then in parenthetics, oh, admirers, praise not me. In other words, he says, I don't, need, I don't need for you to praise me here. Compliment not me. You make me wince. It's interesting how he jumps then from speaking to the felons to now speaking to those who would say, how dare you equate yourself with them? Or, wow, what a nice job you are. In other words, oh, nice job, nice job, nice job. You make me wince. I see what you do not. I know what you do not. Now, these admirers that he's talking to, obviously have some kind of possible religious bent. In other words, he is saying to the religious, I want you to understand, I do not wish to be somehow considered religious, maybe spiritual, but not religious. And of course, that distinction we've spoken of elsewhere. Notice now we're back to it after the parenthetics end. Inside these breast bones, and that's of course a fascinating construction, we've seen it already. I lie, smirched and choked. You'll remember this smirch from Song of the Occupations, number five. Smirched and choked. In other words, what it is he says that I truly am troubles me deeply. Now, obviously, there's a psychological reading of Leaves of Grass. We've talked about it before. The great Harold Bloom has obviously commented on it many, many times. What is it that Whitman's trying to hide and somehow make manifest simultaneously? Beneath this face, we've heard this about faces and masks, that appears so impassive, hell's tides continually run. We obviously think of our Dante. And in the moment that we think of our Dante, we go, yes, you're right. This, in fact, is a moment when Whitman is tipping his hat towards his linguistic and literary predecessor, uh, the great Dante. He says, hell's sides, tides continually run. Lusts and wickedness are acceptable to me. Now, there are readers who are going to be okay with everything he's done up to this point until he gets to this word acceptable. But what does he mean by acceptable? I would, th I would argue that he's arguing it's common. In other words, I am every bit as fallen, as evil, as wicked, as lustful, as anyone who we might look at and say, oh, how terrible they are. I walk with, now this is interesting, I walk with. This phraseology is, of course, very much about Christ, but it's also going to take us back to Song of the Open Road. I walk with delinquents with passionate love. I feel I am of them. I Notice the dash. I belong to those convicts and prostitutes myself, of course, for the heart, uh, many argue the greatest poem of Lisa Grass is Song of Myself. So for him to use the word myself here makes sense. And henceforth, it's interesting the word henceforth. It's almost as if he's making a decision. A, a decision. Remember the opening lines of Song of the Open Road, a foot and lighthearted, I take to the open road, healthy, free, the world before me. He will say it there, henceforth as well. I, I'm done. I'm making a decision. I, and henceforth, I will not deny them. Again, the dash. For how can I deny myself? 
Well, I find this just a compelling, compelling challenge to all of us as readers to say, why must we always look at others and put them down? That's going to be his question. Can we identify with the great pain and suffering of the world? Well, at 2A, obviously, the argument here is that the greatest poets, the greatest artists are the inclusivists, the ones that can see every every individual and somehow identify with them. And I think that's what great poets do. I think this is why Whitman continues to be read and studied today. At 2B, uh, well, obviously the power of the rhetorical question, without doubt. And obviously the allusions and references that he's making to the especially biblical Christian uh, Gospels text, no question. At 3A, well, our, our, obviously we can make so many, so many connections here. Obviously the poem, To Him That Was Crucified, to this poem, is going to argue that notion of true religion that Gandhi obviously would play with and MLK would play with, that notion of inclusivity, the idea that we've got to reach out to see everyone. Think about the Bhagavad Gita, the great Hindu text, and to see oneself in all being and all being in oneself is the definition of true love, right? And of course we think about the great uh, opera Les Mis to look into the face of another, or, or to love another is to see or look into the face of, of God. At 3B, let's go ahead and challenge ourselves to ask this question. Can we do what is the case of Burns's to allow, as we commented elsewhere at learnstrong.net, that notion of, wouldn't it be great if I could just see the world through another's eyes instead of just through my own? How hard is that for you? And is it possible that your study of Leaves of Grass is helping you to become more willing to see the other, especially the downtrodden and those who need love? Thank you.